So I'm concerned about the Gulf, uh, about the Gulf of Mexico and the East Coast. So what that means is there's a big arbitrage right now because the East Coast is short. So we're coming into winter and there's no easy way to get that product to where it needs to be consumed because road diesel and heating oil are the exact same at this point based on all the rules and regulations that have come across. So you have the Northeast that is competing against road diesel, against you know marine gas oil, against things that have an, uh, other homes. And because we don't have the refining capacity after the Philadelphia refiner uh, exploded in June of 2019, and now we don't have Russian product coming in, well, there's nothing to backstop us. Welcome to the Wigan Sessions. Today I have with me Mark Rosano, repeat offender on the show. <laughs> it's always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. CEO of C6 Capital Holdings. Uh, today we're going to be talking about we're going to be talking about the news of oil prices uh, and and how they're affecting the, the rest of the market. But we were just having a conversation about FTX <laughs> affecting or the bankruptcy at FTX uh, affecting crypto. So we'll get into that a little bit. But Mark, let me uh, let me get started by just reading some of these headlines that we collected. <clears throat> Oil prices plunge. OPEC is opening up the, the production lines again. Crude prices hit a 10-month 10, 10 low because there's now more, um, there's more product on the market. Saudi Arabia and other OPEC members reportedly discussing uh, production increases again in January. And uh, OPEC is reportedly considering an increase of up to half a million barrels. So that's 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 like an opening salvo of headlines that lead us into the discussion about the energy crisis um, that we're expecting in as things get colder. <clears throat> sure. Yeah, the uh, the fun and for those that can remember as far back as 2014 and 2015, you, these are the tape bombs that we all know and love where uh, Saudi or someone will test the market with some leak, some sort of, well, let's see how the market reacts to this. Let's see how the market reacts to that. And when then they they look at it and and if you want to go a bit nefarious, you can say that somebody had to clean up an order and they wanted to push down the market a little bit before they could fill it. When you look at the underlying market in general, let's let's look at the two sides to it. So first, they announced a two million barrel a day cut, but we know that just based on the math behind it, it was really something closer to two hundred and fifty to two hundred seventy thousand barrels because West Africa was already well below their allotments. Russia was already well below. Uh, other parts of the Middle East were already below or right at where they where the new number was going to be. And then obviously you have Libya and Venezuela and Iran, which are excluded from the agreement. So when you look at it, it's like, okay, well, Iraq already told you they're not cutting. The UAE already told you they're not cutting. So that really kind of falls to Saudi Arabia and Kuwait to take the lion's share of that cut. And the cut ends up being about 250,000 barrels. Now you take that to the next side and you look at it, it's like, okay, now they, they talk about increasing a, a production by 500,000 barrels. Well, there's, four, there's, there's over 40 million barrels that are still trying to find a home because there's floating storage that's excessive in the Middle East. There's a floating storage that's excessive in West Africa. And you're struggling to, to clear crude because your biggest buyers right now have essentially gotten everything that they need through year end. So they're just trying to play with the market right now. And then this the, to complicate this one step further, there's a crude grade problem. So not every type of oil creates the same refined product. Now, and this can lead to some other conversations that, that we could have around distillate and diesel and heating oil. But right now, there is not enough distillate heavy crude. The, the oil that you make all of uh, your diesel, your heating oil with, there's the, the lighter sweet stuff, which comes out of the US shale, is good for gasoline and the light end. 
So they could also announce this increase, which would open up the ability to, to produce more distillate heavy volumes, which they could then sell at a premium. Because when you look at the market, there's a big bifurcation with lighter crude, gasoline heavy crude trading at a steep discount and the distillate heavy crude, which is trading at a steep premium. So they could look at this and say, well, why am I not going to go get that premium if it's available to me? And that could also be one of those reasons. But they like to test the market first to see how it reacts. And we saw how it reacted. So uh, this, when when they announced the cut in the first place, I was curious about the politics of it. And the mainstream press doesn't do a good job of of understanding that. So what, like as a trader, especially in the energy sector, what was the motive behind cutting production? Like I, I, that was like, um, what, six weeks ago, maybe? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so the it was just a matter of, of, let's call it a shot across the bow of, oh, well, we can always cut production because it's a, it was a big splashy number. It was 2 million. But for anybody that looked at the data, you're looking at it, you're like, well, even if you cut Nigeria, Angola, Gabon, uh, you're there. They're so far below that you'd have to cut another two million to even start to move towards their allotment. You look at the Congo, something similar. So when you look at these numbers, that it was essentially a mark to market of where their production actually is. Now there's some. There's two sides to that coin as well because there are some will say, well, Nigeria can't increase their crude production. There's a production problem. But then the other side of it is, well, they have the most floating storage they've ever had. They are struggling, or I should say seasonally adjusted, the most floating storage in the market. And they're struggling to sell their volumes on a month on a monthly basis with more and more that keeps getting pushed to the other side uh, to the next month. So you're like, well, if I can't sell what's in the market right now, why am I increasing production? And then you could say, well, it's because of Russia, it's because of all these shifts, but there's also that little piece of the macroeconomic universe of slowing in infra uh, slowing infrastructure spending, slowing manufacturing, slowing things along those lines that continue to create a problem around underlying oil uh, oil demand. So again, those are some key pieces that you have to look at when we're talking about some of these numbers, but it was splashy. It sounded good, but realistically, it didn't move the market. Okay. And then um, you're saying that uh, something that's just on people's mind is uh, gas prices that they put in their car. Mm -hmm. Like that's an issue, even going into the heating season. Um, do these increases in output change gas prices at all? So the increase, the gasoline price is an interesting one because there's two dynamics within that. There's you have slowing demand. So if we look at Target, which is to, which gave um, weaker guidance, you look at Amazon laying off individuals, FedEx something similar, Masaryk is cutting their expectations for 2022 trade by two to four percent, and that doesn't include what they see as as a decline in 2023. Then you look at the trucking data, which is at a cycle, the multi cycle low, and back to the uh, to the doldrums of 2019, the consumer struggling. So when you take all of that together, you start to see this the consumer getting stretched. So you're starting to see that demand soften, but you're not seeing a huge build in gasoline in specific regions, but we're not importing the same amount we normally import from Europe because diesel is so expensive and shipping is so expensive. So if I'm a refiner, well, why am I going to import gasoline when I can take this boat and I can export diesel into a very healthy market? So all of a sudden you have this gasoline conundrum where Europe has the most gasoline ever in its, in its seasonally adjusted, obviously, in its history. It's above 2020. In terms of where they are right now, the same could be said for Singapore, a bellwether for Asia, while the East Coast is fairly is about 19 million below normal. So you're like, well, why is nobody closing that gap? And it's because there's it's so expensive to ship right now. The arbitrage of moving gasoline is closed, which is keeping prices higher than it really should be right now. 
but you as you see the seasonality kick in you when you make diesel you inherently make gasoline that will start to uh to fill the coffers a bit more and that will help bring prices down a bit but you're still not going to see a huge drop because refiners need a margin and without uh gasoline prices elevated they're going to have economic run cuts which we think is a big risk going into next year when you look at asia um, you were talking about the the floating capacity. Um, can you just unpack that a little bit? You, what you mean is the product that's already on ships and waiting for their destination. Yes. Yeah, so when you look at the is that shipping, a supply chain issue? So there's there's different pieces to the supply chain. So first you look at the product tankers. So the product tankers right now, because you have Russia who's exporting product into the market. And the Middle East has been taking in that product. And this is where it gets fun because so Russia essentially imports to let's just pick on Kuwait for a moment or UAE, because I think UAE is the most recent. So let's pick on, on Abu Dhabi. So Russia will send diesel to Abu Dhabi. They will then import that into their tank. Then now you have UAE, you know, Abu Dhabi created a uh, diesel from one of their uh, refiners and then Russian product. It's co-mingled and then they export it. Now, I can't pick out which molecule of diesel is, is Russian and which is, is from Abu Dhabi. And this is a way that they can almost cleanse the diesel. Now, UAE wins because they're going to buy cheap diesel. They're going to they're going to pump it into their storage and then kick it out into the uh, the global market. But the problem is. All of this is increasing miles per ton, which just means that a boat is used longer than it normally is. So when you look at something that is normally maybe a 10, 15 day voyage because you're going from one port to another in Europe or you're on a pipeline, now you're on a boat that is going into multiple seas, going through multiple ports. So your miles per ton keeps growing. So these boats are just locked up for longer, which is causing this increase. Then you look at at, uh, at crude, same things happening, where now you have more crude that used to go from Russia into Poland, Hungary, Germany, going all the way around to go to India, to go to southern China. And you're seeing these miles per ton increase, which is absorbing a lot of this capacity, driving up prices. And just creating a, a a very big supply chain issue, not because there isn't enough boats. It's just it's just the movement of that supply chain has gotten stretched. And so, if I'm hearing you correctly, that's a just entirely politically motivated price hike. <laughs> yes, yeah, just exactly. You're you're seeing, it. and then and then you want to take another price hike on the U.S. side. You know, we won't allow. Uh, a foreign vessel to take uh, to take product or crude or LNG from one U.S. port to another U.S. port. You have to be a sanctioned Jones That's Act Jones vessel, Act, right? right? Yeah. So you need a Jones Act, which is your your uh, your American flagged, American made, American manned to go from Houston to New York Harbor. And that's creating this massive price spike, which is why when you look at the diesel front, you're looking at this, you're like, you know, everyone in New England is is worried about if, if they're going to get heating oil. And the Texans are looking around saying, guys, we we have we have more than enough. How, how do we get it to you? Tell us how we get it to you. And we will happily make that trade. And it's just because there's no cheap way to do it. And, and it, that's why you have the uh, Houston, you know, Texas and, and the Gulf of Mexico exporting into Europe taking away some of that European demand, and then we're absorbing from the Atlantic Basin what normally goes to Europe to attract that and try to keep that price, uh, you know, try to cap prices to whatever is possible and make more available. Are you concerned about a shortage in diesel? We've been writing about that a little bit because uh, there's a lot of people that are, but then there are the people that aren't. And the concern, just to, to characterize it, is uh, trucking and trains. And so are you concerned about that? So I'm concerned about the Gulf, uh, about the Gulf of Mexico and the East Coast. So what that means is there's a big arbitrage right now because the East Coast is short. So we're coming into winter and there's no easy way to get that product to where it needs to be consumed 
because road diesel and heating oil are the exact same at this point based on all the rules and regulations that have come across. So you have the Northeast that is competing against road diesel, against you know marine gas oil, against things that have an, uh, other homes. And because we don't have the refining capacity after the Philadelphia refiner uh, exploded in June of 2019, and now we don't have Russian product coming in, well, there's nothing to backstop us. So now you have this big shortfall that exists in, in, in pad one, which is the East Coast, but more specifically pad 1A and pad 1B which is that New England down to the mid Atlantic uh, to, you know, it's, uh, just above the mid Atlantic. You want to consider the tri-state area. That is where there's a, we have a huge concern of availability and what that price is going to be just because there's no easy way to get it there. We have colonial pipeline, which is fully tapped out. Mm -hmm. And now you have, well, you can rail it. If you can say, well, I, I can just, you know, to put it on a, a rail car and send it north, it's like, well, that's really expensive. So what's the cost of that? Is it cheaper for me to send or more uh, more profitable for me to send my product into, let's just, let's just pick on France for a moment, send it to France. And now France is no longer a buyer. So the UAE cargoes that were coming into the Atlantic Basin land in New York instead of landing in France. And those are some, some different ways uh, or Rotterdam or, you know, pick your, pick your location. And that would be a way to, you know, back uh, on a back of an envelope trying to get stuff through, but you're increasing cost. So even if you have all this volume, there's no way to reduce cost because transportation is still so expensive of getting that product into uh, the East Coast. But is that is that going to be an issue just for heating? I, we talk a lot about um, heating oil in uh, in the Northeast. Is that going to be an issue? I mean, it's going to be a cost increase. Mm -hmm. But is uh, is the supply going to be there? No, uh, not in the quantities. I mean, it, it's going to we have to we have to hope Mother Nature is kind. But yeah. if we but have that's what they're saying about Germany, too. Right. Yeah. Like yeah. they're saying, yes, Germany better hope for a warm winter. <laughs> well, and, and that's the problem. Like you, you're leaving yourself open to an unknown of is Mother Nature going to give us a polar vortex or, or are we going to be wearing shorts in December? And that's, you know, do you really want to be you know, do you really want to play chicken with mother nature? We've seen how she wins time and time again. Yeah. So when you look at it, you know, the availability is going to be a huge problem. And to your point, if there is a polar vortex and all of a sudden they have to rush out and buy product, is there any going to be available? And the answer is no, at least not quickly. I mean, even back in 2017, 2018, I mean, we had family up in uh, in in Rhode Island and in, in Massachusetts that couldn't get heating oil for up to two weeks. I mean, that that's not that's not normal. Yeah, you know, we shouldn't have problems like that, but that's the world that we live in today. Yeah, that's uh, I don't know. That seems like the strain on the system was only exacerbated by the pandemic, but it was already there. A hundred percent, which is why when I started my private equity fund, we wanted to invest, and this was in 2019, we wanted to invest in diesel and finding ways to increase the production of diesel because there was a natural shortfall that was already showing itself on the East Coast, in the Atlantic Basin in general, because they, we're not finding enough or producing enough distillate heavy crudes. So it's already good at getting more expensive to create diesel because you have to pay up to get the right type of crude blends. Then you have, well, once I get the crude blends, where do I send it? Who do I send it to? Where's my top buyer? And if the East Coast isn't willing to pay top dollar, uh, someone else will. So now you have these competitions and we can't supply ourselves in the Northeast. You know, can we supply more than enough in the in in uh, in the Gulf of Mexico? Sure. But then you have to get it from the Gulf of Mexico to the actual destinations. And there's no easy way to do that because of uh, infrastructure limitations within the U.S. and then political limitations with the Jones Act. So um, walk me through the investment process. You have a private equity fund that but essentially a fund like yours tries to solve um, market issues, right? Correct. You, yes, you make yes. money by investing in, in, in areas where you see like a gap of trans, uh, transportation or whatever. Mm -hmm. So that's what you do. So just walk me through the investment process. Like, how do you think about it? 
And what are you looking at? Sure. So when we started this back in 2019, we we looked at the market and we saw a lot of opportunity in the private sector, not so much the public sector. And we we saw a, a global shortfall of energy infrastructure. Now that's obviously a massive term. What does that mean? What so we wanted to bucket it into three locations. One is hydroelectric. So we saw a shortage of base load power. And we wanted to find a way that we could we could capitalize on the green movement while providing base load that is going to be there 24-7. Then we turned and we said there is a global food shortage. Fertilizer is massively energy intensive. We wanted to find a solution to increase fertilizer, uh, fertilizer production while trying to stay and find waste products to do so. And then on the diesel front, you know, in, in terms of refining, good luck trying to get a, a crude refiner built. But there, are, there we found this one company that per, uh, creates renewable diesel using wood waste as well as ag waste. Now, the beauty of renewable diesel is one, you're not taking food to make fuel, and it's molecularly the same as petrol diesel or crude diesel. So, we wanted to find a way to address these problems with the view of GHG and, and ESG in mind. But one thing I learned long ago, taking enough ethanol facilities into and out of bankruptcy, is that government subsidies should pad the returns, not drive the returns. Because a stroke of a pen can instantly change your profitability. And we wanted to find companies and assets that stand on their own two feet. And we wanted to show, look, you can have a, a environmental mindset while still making money and delivering value without saying, oh, well, I don't know if you saw Japan just told everyone that they have to buy turtlenecks because if you wear turtlenecks, you will keep yourself warm and you'll reduce your consumption of energy. That's ridiculous. That is not a solution to anything. But there's a way to, to, to build more LNG capacity to, well, to make maybe. more LNG available. Maybe if you're farming uh, sheep in New Zealand, it is <laughs> true. Yeah, maybe we should get into the to, to the wool trade. But you're yeah. you're you're watching the absurdity of this. It's like so you're you're forcing discounts and sales of turtlenecks to keep people warm, where we can actually look at this and look at the shortages. Can can we increase LNG availability? Can we can we develop and capture flared gas to take that flare gas that was a pollutant and is now powering your home and your heat? Like there are ways to look at this with a environmental mindset while still de delivering value and capturing something that is going to have longevity behind it. So let's talk about inflation a little bit, too, because um, that is definitely impacting, obviously, the mm -hmm. the energy markets. But most of the trends that you've been describing up to right now in this conversation are they predate any concern of inflation and they predate any lockdowns in the economy. Mm -hmm. So what impact did um, low to negative in, uh, interest rates have on like the way that the uh, uh, energy markets developed over the past, say, 15 years. Sure. So you created a artificially low hurdle rate where all of a sudden money was free. Uh, you know, everybody was was buying in on the green movement. You had a ton of subsidies that were being thrown out. So instead of looking at things and understanding the math of supply demand economics, looking at the grid, dispatchable power, it was just how can I get the best subsidy the fastest and capitalize on the fact that I can borrow money at one and a half percent. And that's something that then after borrowing money at one and a half percent, I can then go to the government and then essentially get you know two percent back. And I can whether or not this product, this product or project works, I'm gonna make money. And you you watch this grift and this and this insane inflammatory in, uh, world start to emerge where it wasn't about the math and the economics. It was, well, the economics work because the government's paying me to make it work. And that's why when we saw all of this, then you see these adjustments and, and now you're left with these policies and these projects that don't deliver the value that they've that they were supposed to. And you have these stranded assets, which spent billions on, you know, in some cases, trillions in total, and you're not getting what you were supposed to because 
anybody who understands physics and chemistry and, and the and the way the 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 electron moves and the way the world works just rudimentary math you're like that's not going to be enough like what what are we what are we trying to replace here so between the the insane low rates and the amount of liquidity pumped into the market you created this artificial floor if you will that oh this was going to be fine and low and rates were going to be low forever now the UN has come out and said that you know raising rates is the worst policy decision that we've ever had well, what about the last 10 years? How is that not the worst policy decisions that we've ever had? You know, we're, we're just going to keep rates low forever. This is going to be fine forever. No, like we have to be diligent about liquidity, about, you know, saving this for a bad time or, you know, a COVID type situation or lockdowns, if you will. But now you 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 essentially dumped all of this money into the market and even as we head into a recession similar to the 70s, you have no choice but to take the liquidity out because you were so greedy for so long. And that's going to create these broad shortfalls. But in my opinion, and this comes back to FTX and all of this grift getting pulled out of the market without free money, people are, have to look at returns again. They have to say, well, I can't just dump money into an Uber that I've given you billions of dollars and you've delivered no actual value in terms of cash appreciation. So my hurdle rates go up. My cost of capital goes up. When are you turning a cash flow? When are you, when are you returning cash? When are you, when are you cash flow positive? How quickly will that happen? And I'm hoping that this is going to clear this glut, but the inflation- Wait, can, I, sorry, can, can I stop you right there? Because sure, you're saying, you're saying uh, this, but, but you're talking about the- the era that we've moved into of rising interest rates. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Which, okay. which I think is, is getting us back to a point where now you're seeing the companies go bankrupt that were, were just lived on cheap capital or, or as uh, the, the, the news calls them zombie companies where you're just alive because you can borrow another dollar at, you know, 0.5%. So that, that dollar is cheaper. So you can keep funneling it in. But now when that dollar is 5%, 6%, 7%, well, your cost of capital is going up. You know, your interest expense is going up. So you don't have the ability to continue to do that. And that's when you're starting to see some, I think, rational thought coming back into the investment world happening. Yeah. So the way you're talking is interesting to me for this reason, that you're at the intersection of essentially the fossil fuel energy market. And like the political headwinds that are moving into the um, the green energy phase of whatever we do, mm -hmm. and the the entire thing was fueled by cheap money. Correct. I'm I'm sort of characterizing what you've said, but uh, but what? How do you think about that as an investor? <laughs> well, when you look at it from an investment, there like there are places that solar works. There are places that wind works, but there are also places that it doesn't because of topography, geography, you know, longitude, latitude matter in terms of solar intensity. So you have to be considerate of, well, what is what do we need what are we trying to achieve? Well, how much base load power do we need available? What is what are winter conditions? What are uh, solar conditions, what are wind conditions, because we need to create something that is going to, to work. You know, if you want to build solar in the middle of Nevada, go for it. There is no issue with that. It works beautifully, but you need to allow me to build wireline. You know, is solar going to have the same impact in the middle of uh, Minnesota on November 22nd? No, it's not going to have the same efficiency ratings as it does in, in, in the Sandy, uh, you know, uh, the sandy deserts of Nevada, like they're going to be different. And you need to respect that and appreciate it in the sense of we're going to need a fossil fuel to back that up. And there is a uh, technology out there that can capture that carbon, that can do something and turn it into a usable industrial gas that we can use and sell. But we have to be diligent about what we're trying to achieve in a way that makes the most sense. And that is going to be complementary to and take advantage of the topography and geography that we're working in on a uh, on a seasonal basis. How much do you have to um, worry about 
the shenanigans go uh, <laughs> that go into what we call fictitious capitalism, right? Uh, yes. FTX just declared bankruptcy. They went from thirty-five billion to zero in like what eight days or something like yep. that. Yep. Like, how do you that that impacts the market outside of any kind of speculative era area? Like people are are betting on cryptos. That's their own choice. They can do whatever the fuck they want, and they just do it, right? But when something big like FTX happens, it impacts other areas of the market. A hundred percent. Because when you're when you look at that those billions of dollars, that was money that went to FTX and not to another industry, another company. You know, we were talking before that somebody didn't invest with me. Back in November of uh, of of twenty, what was it, twenty twenty one? Instead, they doubled down on FTX, and it's like, well, and 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 their 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 comment to me was, well, in three months, I can more than double my money, and you're telling me that you're going to have unlevered returns of seventeen percent. So why would I go with you at seventeen percent unlevered, where I can go over here and I can get fifty percent every three months? And my comment was, well, that ends when rates go up, but you, you, it's absorbing capital. And I'm just speaking from a small position, but if you extrapolate that out and you look at the companies that were invested in FTX from, uh, from uh, SoftBank down to uh, Renaissance, you know, you're yeah. looking at massive capital that was absorbed. That could have gone somewhere else, somewhere more useful if anybody, I, literally anybody did a, a, an ounce of due diligence. But regardless, you know, apparently some 29 year old was going to unseat the US dollar with what Navy, I don't know, but that was the, the mindset. And you had this, this movement of capital. But now as people uh, are forced to do more diligence, I think you're going to get that, that redistribution of capital, which happens in the business cycle, which is why we have business cycles to send these these <laughs> these garbage fires, for lack of a better term, in, uh, term into bankruptcy. And then, if there's value there, you'll come out of bankruptcy a better company. And if there's not, you go into liquidation, and people go, they take their lumps and bruises, and they go invest a different way. So let's talk about value itself. What? What is it that people saw in FDX first? And then what is it that you look for when you're when you're investing in it in terms of intrinsic value is probably the best way to say it, right? Yeah. So it, it's funny. I, I, I'm not really quite sure what people saw in FTX, but the, the, it was the view that exchanges were going to be a means of transactions. It was going to be a means of, of movement of product and, and move crypto into the mainstream as a, as a movement, free movement of capital. But when I heard somebody describing yield farming, I kind of looked at them and I was like, you just described a Ponzi scheme. And they're like, oh, no, 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 it's yield farming. I said, no, I, I heard you, but that's literally a Ponzi scheme. You just described it. And now you're seeing it in terms of the, the knock-on effect uh, bankruptcies because there was so much cross-communication, so much doubling down of collateral that this was never real money. It was essentially this Brit, this built up nonsense where everybody was was relying on everyone else's balance sheet and then doubling it down to show reserves. When I'm looking at something now, I'm old school, which has probably worked against me over the last couple of years. I want physical assets. And the reason why I say that is because when I look at the world right now, we're going from an inflationary into a stagflationary basis and then likely a deflationary cycle. So I want to own things that are going to be cash yielding and have what I like to call recession resistant. Nothing's recession proof. I, we, we've all learned that in every recession we've ever traded in, invested in. You're going to get hurt, but you want to find things that are going to be there on the other side. And that's why we wanted to be in base load power, that there's an intrinsic value. There's a demand increase in terms of electrification mandates. You have supply coming down because we're shuttering natural gas, coal facilities. Then you look at food. We have mismanaged our soils for 60 plus years. You know, there is a food crisis right now that is only getting worse, that has been terrible before this. 
And now the UN just announced we're over 8 billion people. So we're still reproducing like cockroaches, but yet we don't have the food to support us. So where are we going to bridge that gap and how are we going to bridge it? And, and we have to be smart about it. And, th and that's when we're looking at things of this is a physical entity. I can see it, touch it. There's a supply demand model that I, I'm going to have a cash flowing basis because cash is going to be key. The asset will protect us on an inflationary basis, a stagflationary basis. But as deflation starts to kick in, we think towards the middle to back end of this decade, that cash is going to carry more value and provide a certain amount of uh, staying power through multiple different cycles. What do you think the impact of um, moving money, like exchanging paper, which is exactly what was happening with uh, FTX, hmm. on uh, manufacturing output? So there, there has been, both because of the green movement and because of fictitious capitalism, there, there has been a, uh, a, a slower investment in um, manufacturing capacity and in transportation and that like the very things that we need to make the economy work. Right. What do you think the impact of that has been? It's because it's 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 a question that has plagued me for like 20 years. Like, why do we keep trading paper when we should be <laughs> buying goods? <laughs> well, it, it's funny because you had the gig economy, you know, pro cropping up where everybody was just going to. So there, there was it was multi-staged where in if you look at the 60s and 70s, when this all really began, we exported inflation, imported deflation and created the taking advantage of cheap labor closer to the asset of the raw materials, intermediate goods. But that cycle runs out. So then you got, went from that and then computers got better. Then you had supply chains improving and then you had at time deliveries. You know, I, I'm sure everybody who got so tired of hearing the term asset light inventories or at time deliveries during the 2010s, where every company was 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 talking about how they were going to have no inventory, minimal cost and at time deliveries were going to be a thing of the future. And you're watching this and it's like, well, you have to rely on a boat to get you from China to uh, from, you know, let's call it Africa, uh, South Korea and Japan in terms of raw materials, intermediate goods. They then all have to converge on China. You then have to put it all together in China. Then you send it over to California. Then from California, you have to move it through the economy, uh, through through the, the U.S. to get to the stores. It's like, that doesn't sound very efficient in terms of the structure of using diesel boats, all these other key pieces, as you said, that drive the economy. And so our view was that starting in 2016, you were going to start to see a adjustment to the global landscape because you can only, I don't want to say take advantage, but let's just say take advantage of cheap labor and easy environmental legislation for so long before people get wealthier, they demand better working conditions, they de demand better water and whatnot, and the costs go up. So then you start to see that recycling and they move to other cheaper places. So you saw it in clothing back in the 2010s, where you went from China to Bangladesh, to Indonesia, to the Philippines, to India. And now we're at a point of, oh, well, supply chains are really important. We finally realized this. So nearshoring and onshoring is a new term. And a lot of these facilities are coming out of China. But now we're left with, but on whose grid? So you're going to bring back all of this manufacturing to the US. You're going to build all this ba these this battery capacity, the semiconductor capacity. Do you understand how much juice that takes? Do you understand how much water that consumes? Where are we going to get the natural resources and the and the and what grid is going to, to support this given you're going to add a significant amount of base load just because the, a Samsung facility is going to run 24-7, a Taiwan, a Taiwan semiconductor facility is going to run 24-7, that's a lot of power in a grid that is already super fragile. So there's a lot of key pieces that need to be invested in, which where we see opportunity in terms of trying to take advantage of these investments because we need to build the underlying infrastructure. We have the labor, we know we do, but do we have the underlying capacity to support such a big endeavor. So when you're looking at specific investments, then you're you're factoring in ge geography and like 
shipping and and like what what you can get to that place at the same time that's i think that's what you're saying but, absolutely but what what about politics cuz it always bothers me that this conversation turns into politics cuz cuz we've got the green energy movement and we've got um we've got issues with um the war in <laughs> in russia or in ukraine like how do you how do you factor that into the investment decisions? Like, cause I, I see what you're trying to do is you're trying to solve problems in the marketplace. Mm -hmm. And then you want to invest in the places that are going to be most productive in that sense. But there's a lot of like unknown unknowns to use right. uh, Rumsfeld's <laughs> <laughs> yep. phrase. And that's where we, we're very specific on the regions that we deal with and the regions that we work with, because there are some places that are better than others in terms of accessibility, in terms of, uh, you know, flexibility with build outs and, and structure, which is why it becomes very important. But it, to your point on, on economics and politics and how they converge, we look at things uh, and find ways where the political sphere or the at least subsidies aren't driving our returns and and it's not something that we have to tap the government to to build or to structure or to finance it's something where if we can well, don't, don't get me wrong we'll, we'll take government financing but it's not something where we need a, a prolonged subsidy backdrop and that's why we're very specific on the countries we'll deal with and the locations that we'll deal with and especially Let's be fair. Not only is do you have to worry about politics, but who are your business partners? You know, do, do they have a lot of lobbying capacity? You know, if you look at someone like, let's just take uh, Samsung for a, an example. If Samsung says we're going to build a plant in Alabama, it's going to be they have a lot of buying power in in D.C. Now, if some no name is a startup and they're saying that they're going to build in in the middle of North Carolina, well. Okay, how how are you going to do that? How are you going to achieve that? Who is who's your backer? Who's your essentially your big brother, your godfather that's going to make sure that you can walk through the political cycle without being pushed back on? And and it becomes difficult and to try to find the right partner that have similar values, but at the same time can walk through the process in a uh, in in a in a normal, faster fashion. Let's talk about fracking a little bit. Um, so this was actually given to me by our producer, Judge, sure. the frack spread count. Yes. So, yes. and it's a proprietary, uh, thing that you have that you Correct. use. What, what does it, what does it mean? <laughs> sure. So the, uh, the, so uh, hydraulic fracturing is, uh, so a frack spread is, the, it actually has two terms in the energy market. There's one where it's hydraulic fracturing. Uh, where you're actually going down into the shale and you're fracturing the the shale, you're releasing the hydrocarbons and you're pulling them to the surface. And then the other is where you're breaking natural gas and natural gas liquids into their own components. We're on the hydraulic fracturing side. So what we're doing is we're looking at all of the completion crews and the completion crew or frac spread are the guys that are out there with anywhere from 45 to 50,000 horsepower that are pumping water, chemicals, and propin or sand for the most part at this point down hole and using that pressure to create those natural those fractures, taking advantage of any natural fracturing in the in the shale itself and pulling those hydrocarbons to the surface. Now, while Biden has been very aggressive in shutting down offshore drilling, you know, he has quietly stopped uh, putting hurdles in place for fracking. And that's where we've seen a resurgence of activity, and we've actually seen it grow on the natural gas side, on the liquid side, and more, and uh, most recently on the uh, on the crude side, which is where we see that production. So what we're doing is we're following every single spread throughout the lower forty eight, looking at where the activity is, who's doing the activity, you know, what EMP, what oil field service company, how are they doing it? You know, there's multiple ways to do it in terms of a zipper frack and uh, a a um, a, uh, uh, a, sl a sliding sleeve. There's a lot of different ways to do it, and then the most recent is a is a dual frack or simul frack where you actually do two wells at the exact same time 
you increase your horsepower from 50 to 75, but now you do two instead of one, increasing uh, efficiencies, increasing the, you know, the, the time savings to increase your production, which is what we've seen. And let's be fair, we need the natural gas. We have a lot of LNG capacity coming online. We have a lot of local consumption, and we're trying to find the areas that are most active and the companies that are going to profit the most. Do you, well, how do you answer uh, environmental concerns when, when you're questioned about that? So when you look, when you look at the process, it, it's funny, were there issues at the, at the beginning? Absolutely. And, and there's always some of that, that, uh, those learning curves where they, we weren't doing complete casing. So water was, uh, you know, chemicals were getting into the, into the drinking water. We had frack ponds where they, we, the liner was thin, it was leaking. We've tightened a lot of that up. And now when you look at the efficiency and the carbon footprint, it continues to diminish. And, and that's where, when you look at the value add to the, to the market in terms of reducing carbon emissions across the whole scope, it's actually, it's getting better because of fracking without the cause of fracking. Now, the biggest thing, which is what one of the things that we've always been uh, adamant about is finding ways to not use disposable uh, dispo water, you know, water disposal wells and finding ways to not use acid wells. And that's where Soltech, which is one of our investments on the sulfur side uh, for fertilizer, they actually take the sulfur as a waste product and turns it into an organic fertilizer. You know, there are companies that are taking water production, there's cleaning it and then cycling it back into the process to minimize the footprint. So there are a lot of ways that this is actually a good thing overall for the environment. And let's be fair, most people that are in the energy space, they like being outdoors. That's why they chose this profession. So they're not going to actively go out there to pollute the environment because most of them are hunters or hikers or, you know, like to camp. And, and so this year's talking the, to people that want to protect the outdoors, not destroy it. Um, if people want to get more information about your uh, your investments or your investment strategy, uh, how do they do that? Sure. You can uh, find me on uh, Twitter. Uh, it's um, at Mark FNY. Uh, you can, my email is mrosano at c6capitalholdings.com, or you can find me on Primary Vision Network, which is our YouTube channel. And, uh, and we have a newsletter coming out that, uh, that has launched on the Daily Freedom Financial Press. And we're going to have more newsletters on the back end of that. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you, Mark. It's always a pleasure to talk to you because you're like an encyclopedia. <laughs> <laughs> well, I appreciate the time and thanks for having me on again. It's yeah. always a pleasure. Yeah.